Our next lecture is on JSF internationalization. Internationalization is an important feature for any web-based application. Internationalization is implementing the features in your application to support multiple languages. JSF has full support for Java I18N. Again, I18N is the short form for internationalization. You can use internationalization in pages and in beans. You can configure your supported languages in the faces config file. JSF provides the ability to dynamically switch locales and you can also override default JSF message and error texts. The locale config element is used in the faces config file and specifies a default locale and any supported locales. The above code here nested within the locale config element would support English, German, and Italian. We use the lowercase two-letter codes as defined by ISO 639. Strings are added to properties files and registered with JSF using the resource bundle element in the faces config. We would first specify a base name used by each properties file and then would create a messages underscore two-digit locale properties file for each supported locale. Again, XY is our two-letter language identifier, and the files are placed in the specified package. In this case, they would be placed in org icefaces training example. In each of these messages properties files, we would specify a key used in our page or bean, along with the internationalized value for that key. So for example, the contents of messages underscore English top properties would be on the left hand side the key and on the right hand side the internationalized value for that key. And, and the same applies to the German equivalent. In our page, we can access these properties files using the expression language. The expression language uses the var element specified in the resource bundle to retrieve key values. So here we have two different types of notation used to retrieve our message properties files for first name. And these would display the first name in English and in German. Now in order to use internationalization in our beans, we can access these properties files using the Java Util resource bundle. So here we will get the bundle org icefaces training example messages for the default locale. And then we could, for example, print out the string for first name. And this would display again first name in English and the equivalent in German. JSF allows a developer to override the standard framework and error messages. So most commonly these include validation and or conversion messages. You can modify these by overriding existing keys in a message bundle. So what we would do is declare the message bundle in the faces config. So here in the application node we have a message bundle pointing to org ice faces training example JSF dash override. We would then make our JSF dash override underscore locale properties files located within this location. The JSF override underscore locale properties file can reference existing keys. For example, the JSF key for the default required message is JavaX faces component uiinput.required and in the properties files we could then override the value by specifying that same key but again having our internationalized label be missing a value and so this will change the validation message for when we specify 
required equals true on any of our components. We can see the full list of default JSF keys in the JSF implementation jar, and we've also provided a two-page appendix at the end of these slides. We can also override the standard messages on a component-by-component -component basis, and this is available on input components. So for example, we can use the following attributes, the required message, converter message, and validator message. But it's still best practice to use a properties file since it's less prone to copy and paste errors, it's centralized in one location, and easier to maintain. Now JSF supports the ability to dynamically switch locales. JSF detects the language of each user's browser and if the locale is listed as supported in the faces config then it will be automatically used. Developers can also dynamically switch the locale so for example the current locale is set in the page via the fview locale attribute model bean dot current locale and then in our bean we could change the locale by calling the faces context get current instance get our view root and then set the locale to be whichever locale we require. JSF does provide some convenience method for locale management. We can get the current locale by calling faces context get current instance get view root get locale. We can get the default locale from the faces config by calling get application get default locale. We can get all supported locales from our faces config by again calling get application but get supported locales. And if you are interested in internationalizing your application, it's handy to familiarize yourself with the Java Util locale class. Now here are the JSF messages appendix that we can override. So these are the standard JSF message keys. And these are here for you to review should you want to override any of the standard JSF messages. And that concludes our lecture on internationalization. Our next exercise is on JSF internationalization. The goal of this exercise is to implement internationalization in our application. We'll do this by changing the value attributes of each of the H output label components to a value binding. Each value binding will then correspond to an entry in a resource bundle. Our first step is to create a new package called resources and then we'll create a messages underscore en properties resource bundle. Again, the messages will be our base name and the underscore en is our two digit locale. We're then going to paste in the title through to submit applicant key value pairings the key will be used in our page or bean and the value will be our internationalized label for our output labels. So let's go ahead now and create a new resources package. So we'll come to Eclipse and we're going to right click on source and we're going to select new package. So our package path is going to be org.icefaces.training dot applicant dot view dot resources and we're then going to create our new resource bundle so this is going to be a file which we don't see here in our default list of options so we're going to come to other and I'm going to select under general file and select next again our base name is messages and the locale in this instance is English. JSF will automatically detect the locale and retrieve the correct properties file. So messages underscore en dot properties. 
And we're then going to copy in our key value pairs for the output labels in jobapplicant.xhtml. So back to Eclipse and we'll just paste these in. Step two is to add the resource bundle definition to the application node in faces config. Again, we have our base name, which is messages in the resources package, and also our messages variable, which we'll use in our page. So let's copy the application node, and we're going to take this to our faces config file, which again resides in our web, webinf directory. We'll click on the source tab and then we'll paste in our application node. Now the copy and paste does have a little bug in it whereby the base name, the first opening bracket base name does not have a dash. And we'll also make sure that our base name is all on the same line. Step three, we're going to add our value bindings to app, job applicant.xhtml. So we're going to change the value attribute of each of the H output labels. So rather than a hard-coded value, we've now replaced it with an EL expression using the var or variable that we defined in our resource bundle definition in the faces config file. So we have the variable followed by the key, which of course resides in our messages underscore en or any locale properties file. Now if we come back to Eclipse, since this can be a rather tedious step, what I've done is gone ahead and made this change ahead of time. So for each output label, I've added an EL expression which uses the messages var and will use the appropriate key as defined in our properties file. Now, in addition to internationalizing our output labels, we're also going to override the standard JSF messages. So in our same resources package, we're going to create another properties file. This time it's going to be called JSF-override underscore locale, again English. And we're going to override the default JSF message for the required attribute. As we know, if required is set to true on any components in our page, and if the user does not enter a value, a error message will be thrown. And we don't like the, de the default JSF message. It's not intuitive, so we want to override it with something perhaps that our users will find more helpful. In this instance, we're just going to have a key value pair, the key being the Javax faces component UI input required key. And for our value, we're just going to say required. So as a first step, let's go and create our jsf-override underscore en properties file. So we're going to right click on our resources package and select new. Again, we don't see file in our list of default options. So we'll go new general file. And we're going to call it uppercase jsf-override underscore en dot properties and then finish and then we're going to again override the UI input required message so we'll copy that and come back to Eclipse and paste that in and then finally we're going to have to add a message bundle entry into the application note of our faces config file to tell the JSF framework that well we are in fact overriding the standard JSF messages. So coming back to the faces config just under resource bundle but within the application node we'll add our message bundle and again the copy and paste does seem to remove a couple of our dashes here so it should be message dash, dash bundle and it should also be 
JSF dash override. So once we have that complete, we can now restart our application. Again, I have my Tomcat 7 server running. So we're going to restart since we've added some new files and we want to make sure that everything has been deployed to our, to our WAR file. So we're going to run the application and we're going to verify that the labels look correct. And to verify that the labels are actually being pulled from our messages properties file, we're going to change some of the labels and verify that they indeed show up in our browser. We're then going to submit the form to verify that our required message is overridden. So coming back to Eclipse, I'm going to click on the server tab and restart our server. And now I can bring up Firefox and restart the application. And we can see that, well, our, la our labels most likely look correct, but let's make sure that 100% sure. So let's come to messages underscore en dot properties, and we'll change the value for title to be title123. And then Eclipse will hot deploy this change. And we can refresh our browser. And we can see the output label for title is now title123. And we can then submit the applicant. And we can see that we have, in fact, overridden the standard JSF error message for the required error message. And that concludes our exercise on JSF internationalization. The JSF Selection Components JSF contains a handful of basic selection components that are the equivalent to the HTML4 select elements. We have the Select Boolean checkbox, the Select Many List box, among others, and most importantly we have the Select One menu, which is our standard drop-down list. Each selection tag works like a parent-child container and has two necessary parts. The first is the parent tag, which has the currently selected value. So for example, we have an h colon select one menu with a value binding to the bean model bean and the property our color. The child tag will list the available items. In this case, we will have an f select item nested within the select one menu with an item label of red and an item value of lowercase red. The finished select one menu code would look like so. We'd have our encapsulating select one menus and our value binding for our currently selected value. And within that, we will have our drop down choices, which are three select items for the red, green, and blue colors. Selection components rendered to HTML, like so. We will have our HTML select element. And within that select element, we will have our HTML option elements for, again, the three colors. The available items can also be dynamically pulled from a bean. So in this case, we have instead of an F select item, we have the plural F select items tag bound to a array of available colors. The dynamic items could be, again, an array of strings. So for example, red, blue, and green. And the items can now be modified directly in the backing bean list instead of at the page level. Combining the two approaches is a very common practice, and this is useful for adding a default value without modifying our bean. So here we have an F select item with please choose a color, followed by the dynamically bound select items list of colors. By specifying only the item label, the F select item will automatically use the same value for its item value. And we've also used the no selection option for our F select item tag as the default item. And this is going to be used to ensure the user cannot select this item for their submitted selection. Normally bound item lists would be retrieved from a service layer 
And the alternative would be directly accessing the persistence layer, for example, a database, file system, or a web service. And this service layer allows for additional processing and caching of items. And multiple users may call the service layer for a local copy of the item list. And this can be quite convenient. So in this case, we have a getter called available colors. And as long as the list has not already been retrieved, we're going to call database.retrieveColorList. Our next exercise is on JSF selection components. The goal of this exercise is to add two selection components to our page. An H select one radio for the title of the applicant, and this component is going to have nested hard-coded F select item tags. And we're also going to add an H select one menu for country, which is going to have a bound list of F select items as the selection options. We're also going to introduce an H panel grid component to clean up our form layout. Step one is to insert our H select one radio component into our view. So we're going to insert the following markup at the top of the form. We have an output label, our select one radio with a value binding to the title property of job applicant. And we have a hard coded list of F select item tags. And this is not best practice because we have to copy and paste between pages um, using the same component. It incorrectly mixes the model and the view, and it's better to dynamically load from a bean or database. So let's copy and paste this code here to our job applicant.xhtml. And we'll add this below our form tag. So in previous exercises, we had opened our XHTML page with the web page editor. For today's exercise, I'm going to use the HTML editor since we're not relying on the canvas or palette. Step two is to add an insert select one menu component to our view for the country. And we're going to add this select one menu component above our command button at the bottom of our form. Now note the combination of selectable items. We have an F select item which is used to present a default string that cannot be selected by the user and this is done by the no selection option and in this case is set to true. We also, we also have an F select items tag which is a value binding so the values are not hard coded into our page and can be dynamically updated. So let's grab this section of code. And in our IDE, we're going to scroll down just above our command button that will submit our applicant. And we'll just add our select one menu. Step three are to add the variables to job applicant. Again, these are used to bind our model to the view. So we're going to add title and country. And we'll generate the getters and setters using Eclipse. So we'll go to the model package and open job applicant. We'll add the title and country. And we can go to source, generate getters and setters by simply right clicking in our class. We'll select all to generate getters and setters for both variables and we'll select OK. Step four is to create our country list bean. This is going to be placed in the model package and it's going to be application scoped because it serves a common as a common list of countries bound to the H select one menu and can be considered a support managed bean as it's used to again support the functionality of beans. So we'll grab this piece of code here which will dynamically turn our list of countries to our select, um, select one menu. So we'll right click on model and we'll select new class and we'll create country list. And then we'll paste in our, 
our code from our slide. Along with selecting Control shift o to automatically resolve our missing imports for our annotations. Step 5 is to update our server output. So when we submit the form, we're going to output the server values for title, first name, last name, and country. So we'll select that piece of code and we'll go back to jobapplicant.xhtml way at the bottom and we'll just copy over our existing output. And now this includes one for title and country. The H panel grid component is going to render an HTML table and will be used to lay out our existing components. New rows are defined by the integer attribute columns, so once x number of child components are rendered, a new row is going to be started, and these child components are each placed in a table cell. Step 6 is to use the panel grid for our layout, so we're going to add an H panel grid with a columns attribute set to 2, and we're also going to remove the break tags. Now instead of copying and pasting from the slide, we can go to our Eclipse and use the Eclipse Autocomplete feature. So right below our form tag, I'm going to add an opening bracket and I'm going to specify H colon. And I'm going to use the Eclipse Autocomplete feature. So it's providing the list of JSF HTML components. So I'm going to select the panel grid and of course I'll grab our closing bracket here and paste that right below our command button. Now on my way back up to the top of the form I'm going to remove our break tags since they're no longer needed. The panel grid will take care of creating new rows for us. And I'm going to specify that we have two columns. And now we can run our application. We can now see that our contents are displayed in a clean label input table layout. And we've also added the title and country fields. So let's start our application server. And we'll then navigate to our page. So we can now fill out our form. We have a title, Dr. John Doe. And we'll also have our drop-down list for country. And I can submit the applicant. And we can see our server output from our model beans. And that concludes our exercise on JSF selection components. Our next lecture is on JSF input and output components. If we were to write a component in JSF, we would have to create the following three artifacts. The component class, which is the actual Java class representing the core logic of the component. The tag class, which allows the component to be used on our JSF page and the renderer class which contains the code required to render a UI component. The default JSF components render as HTML with the H colon namespace and more information on component development will be covered in later lectures. JSF contains a handful of basic components that are the equivalent to the HTML4 elements for example an H form tag which will when rendered become an HTML form tag, an input text which will render as an input of type text, and various other components such as the input text area, input secret, input hidden, and then we have the output components, output label, output link, output format, and output text. And for example, output text will render a span tag in your markup. 
Component tags are placed on JSF pages or views. This word can be used interchangeably. So for example, here we have an h colon output text, a JSF HTML component. Tag attributes allow developers to customize the appearance and behavior of components. So for example, our output text now has a value attribute with the text hello world and also the rendered attribute which can be toggled to true or false depending on whether we want this component to render but in this case we've hard-coded the value to true. Tags are nested in a parent child containment format for example here we have an H form tag and nested within that tag we have an output label which corresponds to an input text and subsequently generates a field set component followed by the closing H form tag. Bean values are assigned to component attributes using the JSF expression language syntax. For example, the manage bean my beans instance variable value 1 is assigned to the input component as follows. Looking at the code, we have two input texts, the both containing a value attribute which is value bound to the property my bean dot value 1. Again, my bean is the bean name. And in the second example, we have the rendered attribute and in this case we also have an EL expression bound to a property on my bean called value2 and of course this would return a boolean value either true or false. Input components in JSF require that the bound bean property is mutable. A mutable object is when you have a reference to an instance of an object and the contents of that instance can be altered. So in this case we have a setter and getter and if the JSF introspection mechanism can't find the corresponding setter or getter, a runtime error will occur. All other non-value attribute bindings can be immutable, as the setter method is never called by the JSF framework. Output components in JSF assume that the associated value bindings are immutable. Again, this is when you have a reference to an instance of an object, and the contents of that instance cannot be altered. But this is not a requirement. If the JSF introspection mechanism can't find the corresponding getter, a runtime error will occur. Now all non-value component attribute bindings can be immutable as the setter method is never called by the JSF framework. The form input component is a required parent tag for all input components. Any input components in the form tag will be submitted to the server when the submit occurs. So for example, in the case of the form tag with an input text and a value binding of bean.username, the username will be submit when the form is submit. Form tags cannot be embedded, but there can be more than one form per page. Input text is the same as the HTML input of type text element and allows client-side users to input text. The value binding can be of type string, number, and all number primitives, as JSF takes care of conversion with implicit conversion. Input text can be quite powerful when combined with converters, validators, and AJAX tags, all of which will be explained in more detail later. The input text area component is the same as the HTML element input of type text area and allows client-side users to input text. In, for this component, the value binding should be of the type string for the value attribute. Input secret text is the same as the HTML element input of type password and allows the client to enter hidden or secret text. The component attribute autocomplete went off is handy for suppressing the form autocomplete feature of most modern browsers. Similar to the input of type hidden HTML element is the H input hidden component. And this component allows JSF developers to include hidden form data that will be submitted with the other form elements. Now this is not used as often in JSF as in standard HTML since our bean scopes provide more intuitive state saving. The output label renders the same output as the HTML label tag and this is generally used in combination with an input component. 
And when the ID attribute of an input component matches the for attribute of an output label, a field set tag will be automatically inserted by the framework. The output link component renders the same output as the HTML anchor tag. Now it's not commonly used in JSF as most developers use framework features that aren't implicitly supported by the, this component. For example, you will find yourself using the command link and command button components quite regularly. Now JSF2 introduces the hlink component which allows developers to use the HTTP GET submits instead of the standard JSF POST submits. The output format component allows developers to use Java I18N or internationalization message bundles that have specified input parameters. This component will be covered in later lectures around message bundles and a simple example of its usage is, well, the output format has an fparam value and in the value by attribute of the output format we swap in where the bracket zero parameter is and replace that with the fparam value. The output text component renders the same output as the HTML4 span tag and in JSF 2.0 EL notation has somewhat reduced the use of the output text component. For example, we have the simple EL expression mybean.value1 and this is actually equivalent to the H output text component containing that same value binding. However, if we require JSF conversion or validation, we will need to use the H output text component since that component supports those two functionalities. Our next lecture is on JSF command components. The H command button and H command link components implement UI command. JSF provides two ways to detect when a user interacts with UI command components. The first being through the use of an action listener attribute and the second through an action attribute. Action listener and action methods are usually located in a stateless controller bean, not a model bean. Again, a model bean is concerned with data. And during the invoke application phase of the lifecycle, action listeners are called first, followed by actions. Actions are generally used to invoke navigate, navigation. Action listeners, on the other hand, are primarily used to execute business logic that does not result in navigation. Both attributes can be used on a component, although this is rare. But in this case, the authenticate method is called first in the lifecycle, followed by the login method. The H command button renders an HTML input tag of type button. And unlike the input tag, this component will invoke an action listener and or action method when clicked. And this is a fundamental feature of an action-based framework like JSF. We can also specify an image attribute, which will tell the component that it should render a specified image rather than the default button widget. The H command link renders an HTML anchor tag and again unlike the HTML anchor tag this component will invoke an action listener and or action method when clicked again a fundamental feature of an action based framework like JSF. Child elements of the command link tank, tag are wrapped by the anchor tags functionality. Command components execute in the invoke application phase of the JSF lifecycle. Now, conversion and or validation errors encountered in the process validations phase, the third phase in the lifecycle, will cause the lifecycle to skip the invoke application phase. Again, if there are conversion and validation errors, we're going to transition directly from the process validations phase to the render response phase, skipping the update model values phase and the invoke application phase. However, the immediate attribute can be used to move the execution of action listeners and actions to the apply request values phase to ensure that they are called. 
So the immediate attrib attribute would be used with a cancel button to ensure that both action listeners and actions are called. Again, here we have a life cycle diagram. So we can see that actions and action listeners fire in the invoke application phase and value change listeners fire in the process validations phase. But if immediate equals true on a component, then actions, action listeners, and value change listeners are going to fire in the apply request values phase. And that concludes our lecture on JSF command components. Our next exercise is on JSF action events. In this exercise, we will add an applicants model being class to store job applicants. And we're also going to introduce best practices when executing the action listener on our existing H command button. Our first step is to create an applicants manage bean. So we're going to create applicants.java, a model managed bean. Again, model means data. And this is going to be used to store a list of job applicant objects. So we'll copy this code here. And now let's go to our IDE and expand our source folder. And right click on the model package. And we're going to create a class called applicants. And then just for convenience sake, we're just going to paste our code, not overwriting our package name. We have our at manage bean JSF annotation. And this is also an application scope bean, so the lifespan will be for the duration of the application. Step two is to add an array list property to our newly created applicants class. Again, this array list is going to contain our job applicants. So we have our setter and getter. And we also have a refresh method, which essentially calls our setter. So let's copy this code and return to our IDE and paste that within our applicants class and do a control shift F format. And then we can hover over our missing imports. We want to import Java util. And then we'll hover over again array list and import Java util. Or we could just hit control shift O to quickly have Eclipse do this for us. Step three is to now move our action listener. So following best practices, applicant controller will become a stateless controller, so not concerned with data. And it's going to capture JF, JSF events from our page. Now we currently have one action in our application and that's our submit action listener. So we're going to move this action listener method from job applicant a model bean concerned with data to applicant controller, our stateless controller that captures JSF events. And we're then going to rename this method add applicant. So now let's go to job applicant, our bean that stores job applicant related data. And we're going to remove this JSF event and we're now going to place it into our stateless controller. So this class will be primarily concerned with JSF events. And then we'll rename the submit method add applicant. So the first name and last name instance variables are, are no longer available and this is appropriate given that this is now a stateless controller. 
But in this method, we now need to dynamically obtain references to managed beans in the current faces context. So we're going to use a helper class called facesutils, and the method is getManageBean to access the current view scope job applicant. Step four is to add faces utils to our project. So we're first going to create the faces utils class in a new util package. And then we're going to find the faces utils Java class in our solutions folder and copy it into our job application project. So let's first create the faces utils class. So we're going to right click on our source package and select new class and as a convenience method let's click on browse and choose a base name package here so we'll choose org ice faces training applicant view and then we'll append util and again the name of our class will be faces utils And then we're going to go into our solutions folder, into our action events solutions folder, and we're going to copy and paste our faces utils code into our project. Again, this class contains various helper methods, and in this case, we're going to use one that's going to help us get a reference to the job applicant bean in our application. So we'll just copy and paste this code into our faces utils class. Now we're going to add the following add applicant code and we're going to see that it uses the get managed bean method from faces utils. So we're going to obtain a reference to job applicant by calling faces utils get managed bean and then our job applicant name. And we're going to use that job applicant object to get the first name and last name. We're also going to use it to add an error message. And finally, we're going to add an applicant to our applicants managed bean list using the reference to applicants. So let's take this new add applicant method and overwrite our existing add applicant method in applicant controller. And then we'll hit Control shift o to resolve our missing imports. So again, we obtain a reference to job applicant through our faces utils get managed bean method. And then we're going to use that applicant object to get our first name and last name. We're then going to add an error message using the faces utils method. And then if validation has passed, we're going to also add an applicant to our applicants array list. So again, by using the faces utils add error message, we've essentially reduced the following code whereby we create our custom message and then our faces message object then retrieve our faces context current instance and etc to one where we simply call faces utils dot add error message again this utility class is very helpful and can be used in many different scenarios and again the add applicant method can now add the current view scope job applicant instance to applicants list so here we retrieve an instance of applicants and then we call get applicants list dot add and we add our job applicant to our array list.
Now step six is to update our page markup. So in jobapplicant.xhtml, we're going to change the method binding on our command button. So we're going to modify it to reference the method binding on applicant controller add applicant. So we'll just copy this method binding for the action listener and go to jobapplicant.xhtml and we'll scroll down to the bottom where we have our submit button and we're going to replace the existing method binding with one that now uses the add applicant method on the applicant controller class. And then we're going to add server output for applicants added to our applicants array list. So we'll just copy the output in its entirety. And we'll just replace that here below our form tag. And then we'll do a control shift F to format. Now let's run our application and we're going to press the submit applicant button. We'll see that there is a validation failure which short circuits the JSF lifecycle and the action listener is not executed. We're then going to add valid entries to the form fields and press the submit applicant button and this time the full JSF lifecycle executes including the action listener which adds the view scoped job applicant instance to our application scoped applicants applicant list. So now let's return to our IDE and let's start our server and save all of our files. Let's refresh our browser. There we go. And let's now just hit submit. So we can see that again, the action listener was not hit as the process validation failed and we transitioned directly to the render response phase. Now let's enter in valid values. And we'll select just uh, anything, it doesn't quite matter what, and then we'll submit an applicant. And we can now see that we've added a job applicant to our applicants applicant list. And so we could continue to add applicants. And that concludes our exercise on JSF action events. Our next exercise is on JSF action events with the immediate attribute. We are going to add a second command button with an action listener to clear the input in our form. Step one is to add a clear button. So we're going to add an H command button for clear after the existing submit command button. Now notice the immediate attribute set to true. This is going to allow the action listener clear form to execute before the process validations phase. Now with reference to the JSF lifecycle diagram, actions and action listeners fire in the invoke application phase. So if there is a validation or a conversion error, the update model values and invoke application phases are skipped. So in this case, we want the clear form method to fire. So we're going to set immediate to true so that the action listener is executed in the apply request values phase. So let's copy this code and take it to our IDE. In jobapplicant.xhtml, we're just going to add this code below our existing submit button.
Step two is to add a clear form action listener. So we're going to add the following code to applicantcontroller.java. So with immediate set to true, manage beam properties and component value properties need to be cleared. So here we obtain a reference to job applicant through our faces utils get managed bean method. And then on job applicant, we're going to call clear. We're then going to clear component values by retrieving a reference to the containing form and clear all input components in the form. So let's copy this code, clear form, and go to applicantcontroller.java. So we're going to expand source. And then in our controller package, we have applicant controller. And we'll paste our clear form method. Step three is to add our helper methods. So to assist us in clearing bean values, we're going to add the following method to job applicant.java. And so the at post construct annotation will initialize values after instantiation. So we're going to essentially clear all form fields on applicant. So we'll copy this code and then go back to our IDE. We're going to go to job applicant in model. And then we're just going to paste this method and then hover over at post construct and we're going to import the javax annotation. Now remember components have a submitted value as well as a value. The submitted value is the request value, and if conversion and validation passes, it becomes the component value. So to ensure the clear button leaves us with blank form fields and our submitted values do not remain in those fields, we have to clear all of the component values. And we can do this by accessing the component tree on the server and clearing these values. So step four is to add these two helper methods. So our action listener method uses these two methods to find and clear the input components. So we're going to copy both of these helper methods to applicantcontroller.java. We'll format our code and then we'll do a control shift O. So we're going to choose Java util iterator. And now all of our errors are gone. Step five is to now run the application. So we're going to press the add button and then press clear and only component values are cleared. We're then going to add valid entries to the form fields and press the add button. We're then going to press clear and bean and component values are both cleared. So returning to our IDE, I'm going to restart my server to ensure all changes have been pushed across to our deployed WAR file. I'm then going to refresh the application. Here we go. And I'm just going to press submit and then select clear, which of course removes all of our validation errors. I'm then going to enter in some default values, uh, Mr. John Smith. 
and I'm going to submit the applicant. So we have a new job applicant, but the input values still remain in our form. So now I'm going to hit clear, and well, we've cleared all of our form fields. And that concludes our exercise on JSF action events with the immediate attribute. Our next exercise is on the JSF data table. In this exercise, we will create a new page to display the applicant list with an H data table component. The action attribute on the H command button will be used to introduce navigation, and we're going to use dependency injection to inject a service into our applicant's managed bean. Step one is to add the applicants.xhtml page. So in our web folder, we're going to create applicants.xhtml and we're going to paste our doc type, HTML tag, and body. So let's copy this and navigate to our IDE and we'll expand job application. And on web, we're going to right click and select new file. And it's going to be called applicants.xhtml. And then we'll paste in our starter code. Our job applicant XHTML page is backed by the job applicant view scoped manage bean. So navigating via a redirect away from job applicant puts the existing view scope bean out of scope. A new instance of job applicant will then be instantiated when we return to job applicant.xhtml. Now this is the desired behavior as it will result in a new instance of job applicant being added to our list when we execute the add applicant method in applicant controller. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the add applicant command button attribute from an action listener to an action in order to introduce navigation. Step two is to change the action listener to action. So we're going to go into job applicant.xhtml and we're simply going to change our action listener to an action. So here in our XHTML page, we have add applicant, and we're simply going to remove the listener portion. Now in our applicant controller class, we're going to need to change the method signature and add a return statement. So in add applicant, we're going to remove the action event argument and we're also going to add a return statement. So in the case of the first name equaling John and the last name equaling Doe, we're going to return null. Otherwise, we're going to return a string value of applicants along with a faces redirect equals true. So let's go now and add these return statements. So we'll return null in the first case. So let's go to our resources and we'll expand our source folder and we'll navigate to applicant controller dot java and we're going to look for our add applicant method so an action listener method requires an action event argument but an action does not so we're going to remove that and so in our case of the first name john and last name doe we're going to return null. And with that being said, we'll change our method signature to return a string. 
And then in our else statement, we're just going to copy and paste our second return statement. So as we've learned, the action attribute is used for navigation. The string returned from the action method is going to be fed into the JSN, JSF navigation handler. So in the case of first name equaling John and last name Doe, we're going to return null. And when we return null to the JSF navigation handler, it's going to render the same view again. In our second return call, we're returning applicants question mark faces redirect equals true. And this is going to result in a redirect to the applicants.xhtml page. And we're going to discuss navigation in detail um, a little bit later in our training course. Step three is to populate our applicants. So we're going to deploy our application and in jobapplicant.xhtml we're going to submit a few valid applicants to populate our application scoped applicants managed bean. So let's start our application server here. And once that's done, we can hit our application URL, job application slash job dash applicant dot JSF. And we can then create a few applicants. So I'll create three. So we'll submit the first. And then I'll return to job-applicant to create a second. Now we don't have a navigation rule that will return us to this page, so we'll have to manually retype in our URL for our job-applicant form page. And I can also create myself. And, well, I need a large salary. So, again, we have two applicants. And we'll return to our page by navigating back to our URL. And just for good measure, I will add one last. Okay, so now we have three job applicants ready. Now in step four, we're going to now add our H data table. So inside the H body tag in applicants.xhtml, we're going to add the following. We're going to add our H data table component its value binding is going to be to our applicants list, array list. And we have our row variable, our instance variable, row. And we're going to iterate over that variable. And in this case, we're simply going to output the first name in just a single column. We're then going to refresh the page and the first name of each job applicant instance is going to be rendered like so on the right hand side. So just a simple list. So let's copy this code and let's find applicants.xhtml and in our body we're just going to paste our code
Now we can refresh our page and we can now see that well our table is lacking some styling but we do have an H data, an iterative table now in our applicants page. So we have our three applicants whose first names are John, Tyler and Mike. So again the value on our H data table is bound to the list of job applicant instances the var attribute is the variable name used to access each instance of job applicant in the array list. The data table will iterate over each job applicant in the list and create a new row for each job applicant. The H column is used to display the speci specified property of the current var instance. And the F facet tag is used to mark headings. So now let's add a few more columns to our table. So in this instance we're going to add a facet name header, again our header of our column, and we're going to have now have a first name, last name, email address, and country column. So we'll copy this, this code here, and let's return to our IDE, and I'm just going to overwrite our existing column component. So now we can refresh our browser and we're going to see that we have headers along with a first last name email and country um, fields in our columns. So let's return to Firefox, refresh our page, and here we go. So now we have four columns, first name, last name, email address, and country. So in a production environment, add applicant will ultimately persist a job applicant to perhaps a database. The front end of an application typically makes a service call to the middle or back end layers. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a job applicant service interface with the appropriate calls to the back end essentially to simulate a production environment and the job applicant service implementation will provide the current implementation. So we're going to mimic our database calls here through a service layer. So step six is to add the job applicant service interface. So here we're going to not add a class, but a interface. And the package is going to be org IceFaces training applicant services. And the interface name will be job applicant service. So let's right click on our source package and we're going to create a new interface. So let's grab a base package name and just going to services, double check. And it's going to be called job applicant service. and then we can add this interface. Now step seven is to add the following two methods to our new interface. So we're going to have a add applicant method which of course will add a job applicant and we're also going to have a getter call which will retrieve all job applicants. So 
So our implementation will actually have to add the logic for both of these methods. But we're just going to define them in our interface. So we're missing two imports here. We're going to have to import Java util list and then job applicant which is found in our model package. In step 8 we're now going to add our service implementation. So in that same services package we're going to add job applicant service impl and we're going to add the job applicant service interface. So let's right click on our services package and this time we're going to create a class and it's going to be called job applicant service impl of course impl is short for implementation and we're then going to need our interface so if we type in job applicant we can see that we're returned our our correct interface and then we'll select finish so now we have our two auto generated method stubs here Step 9 is to annotate job applicant service implementation. So this is going to be an application scoped bean. So we're going to add our at managed bean annotation as long as our at application scoped annotation. We're then going to add our necessary logic. So we're going to have a applicants list along with the add applicant and get applicants methods. So we'll copy this code. And we're going to overwrite our existing class. Now we'll just clean this up. And again, we can do just a control shift O. It is very handy for including missing imports in Eclipse. But as you've seen, we can also hover over to add a specific import. Now step 10 is to chain our beans. So we're going to inject an instance of job applicant service implementation into our applicant controller. So we're going to do this by adding an instance of job applicant service implementation and we're going to add the at manage property annotation and the value which is going to be this implementation. We're then going to generate the getters and setters and we're going to add a service call and refresh call in add applicant. So here we have job applicant service dot add applicant so if we have success, if an applicant has or will be successfully added, we're going to call our service layer to persist that to perhaps our, our database. We're then going to refresh our list of applicants. So we'll take these two calls to add applicant. So first our add applicant call. Now we're going to go to the applicant controller to add applicant. And we're also going to add our refresh call as well. Now one step that was missed here was just our manage bean property. 
to add that to our applicant controller. So we'll just place it at the top of our top of our class. And then I'll just resolve our missing imports. So we want to import the Javax faces bean and then followed by an import for our services implementation. And then we're going to just actually as per the code make our else statement as per our slide. And then we're also going to need to generate our getters and setters for job applicant service. So we can right click on job applicant service and we can come down to generate getters and setters. So this is an alternative way of generating the getters and setters for an instance. And finally, we can run the application. So in job applicant, we're going to, well, add a job applicant. The action method bound to our submit applicant command button is going to execute. And this is going to redirect us to applicants.xhtml. The application scope instance of job applicant service implementation was injected into applicant controller and the service calls are going to simulate calls made to a backend and then applicants.xhtml should display our new job applicant in the data table. So let's restart our server to republish our application. We're then going to go to job applicant.jsf and then we'll enter some form fields. And we'll submit our applicant. So we're then redirected to applicants.jsf. And now in our table, we have our new entry, a John Smith. And we can also see that in our applicants list, we have, of course, our job applicant for John Smith. And that concludes our exercise on the H data table.